Again, I'm Micah Ransdell. I'm a senior UI engineer at Netflix. I'm working on our transition from uh, two Java stacks to Node.js. Uh, part of the process for us is really figuring out what, what works best for Node and what we can leave in our Java layer and beyond. So uh, who here has heard of House of Cards? All right, great, great. How about uh, Orange is the New Black? People fans of that? All right. That's great to hear that people enjoy our originals. Uh, Netflix is growing like crazy. Uh, we have over 50 million members, and we're available in 40 plus countries with uh, more coming in this next month. So we, we have quite a bit of scale to deal with, um, especially in our UI layer. Uh, we need to be able to support all 50 million members coming to our site at any given time. So our current Java stack is a little like this. It has a lot of features. And uh, we can have a lot of fun in it, but uh, it's uh, a little hard to turn. So it's, you know, it's very stable. Um, we can deploy and not really have to worry about things breaking or uh, you know, going down in the middle of a, of a cruise. It's very full feature. You know, in Java, you can uh, import everything and, and work with lots of different jars and everything. We have you know, hundreds of uh, internal Java dependencies that we use. And uh, this is one case where it's great to have it all in one place. But it needs a pretty large and diverse crew. Uh, so we have people that are Java experts, people that are JavaScript experts, and people that can uh, tune both of those, as well as people that work on deployment and everything, all supporting one app. Uh, and it's not very agile. Uh, when we want to make a change to the entire system, it's going to take months, not days or weeks. Uh, and it's really tough to test. What we really want is something like this, a nice, fast, nimble race car uh, that allows us to make changes on the fly and uh, quickly iterate on those changes. So we need something that's lightweight, uh, allows, it, allows uh, all of us UI engineers to come in and make small little changes. Uh, modules are a great approach for this. So in NPM specifically, and you know, in modular JS more abstractly, uh, the idea is to have one module that does a little bit of work and another module that does another little piece of work. And you keep building on those blocks uh, to allow you to build a bigger system. Another key thing we wanted to do when we were moving to our new uh, node platform was to keep it REST only. Uh, for us, we have an API tier that is uh, built for our client side uh, applications. You know, we have a lot of stuff from our account page to uh, anything on really the home page back uh, that all use client side calls. And we needed to have a way to leverage that existing infrastructure, but we also wanted to use it on the back end. We also wanted to have JavaScript everywhere. We have a lot of UI engineers that are very passionate about JavaScript, and they are. Uh, very smart and able to work really well in that environment, but when they have to switch to Java on the back end, it takes a lot of time and eats up a lot of their uh, brain power. We also wanted to reduce complexity. Uh, a lot of the times uh, when you're building a larger system that's in Java, it, it really can grow to be pretty complex, and we found that it was really tough to go in and make small little changes without impacting every other part of the system. So you're probably wondering, well, none of that really means you have to use Node. So why, why use it? And for us, it was around giving power back to developers. Uh, we needed to have a way for our UI engineers to go in and make changes to the UI layer and have it be uh, immediately impactful and provide uh, a lot of areas for them to improve our systems. I'll go back. Uh, and this logo is actually from our internal project, which is the name of Shakti, uh, which means uh, power or empowerment. Uh, I didn't cover that. So what does that really translate to? Uh, this is kind of a high-level diagram of our architecture here. Uh, I'll give you a moment to take a look at it real quick. But essentially, what we have, our, our node layer is our entire UI layer. We encapsulate our build system our asset packaging and serving for CSS, JavaScript, less. Uh, localization is also included. Uh, templates, 
we're using Dust mostly uh, for client and server side templating. And really, this allowed us to put in uh, a very modular system um, and swap out the individual pieces. Say, if on a page we didn't want to have uh, Dust be the renderer, we could actually use a different framework or a different templating language, um, React or something other than that. Uh, we also have our API client, which handles our uh, communications, our outbound communications back to our uh, REST API. So I'd like to share a few things we learned along the way of building out this application. And we're by no means done. We want everything to be a module. Uh, for us, it makes it a lot easier if we can talk about small little modules that do one thing and do it well. And one way was using common JS on the server. Um, Node is built on that. Uh, and that format works really well for uh, the things we're, we're trying to do in Node. We use ES6 on, for our client side JavaScript. Um, obviously, not very many browsers support that. So, what we do is uh, we transpile it from ES6 back to uh, require.js um, so that we can send it down to the client and use it there. Uh, we also make use of NPM extensively uh, internally, and we also pull in a lot of external dependencies. Um, we have an internal registry which allows uh, not just our team, but uh, the other UI teams across the organization to contribute and see our modules and uh, also give back. Another area that we found was uh, particularly uh, troublesome was in asset packaging. Uh, we have over uh, 50 million members. We do A-B testing constantly, uh, several hundred A-B tests a year, um, not just on uh, the UI, but also in back-end algorithms and everything. And we found that was an interesting problem around how to deliver assets to users uh, that reflect just the experience they should be seeing, not the entire set of JavaScript or templates or CSS that everyone can be seeing. Uh, and my colleague Alex Liu actually gave a talk on this recently, so I won't go too much in depth. Um, but really, it was the solution here was really around how can we package everything up and deliver dynamic UIs without having to redeploy our servers or um, work too hard to get a, uh, a functioning system. We also use, uh, wanted to standardize on how we did our templating and internationalization. Uh, we had lots of different approaches before, and most of them were around you know, I can, I can do this in Apache tiles, or I could do this in uh, Mustache, and people kind of went all over the place. And so we, we chose Dust for the uh, server-side uh, rendering, and then we found that it worked really well for client as well. Uh, we've, we've since made it easy to swap those things in and out. And for internationalization, really, that, that problem for us is we have, we only support about 10 languages right now, uh, but that's going to grow. And we want to make sure that uh, we can have a system that will work well for the future and not just currently. Another area where we spent a lot of time on was our build process. Uh, we use Gulp for our build process. Uh, it has worked really well for us. We start out with Grunt and uh, found that it didn't really scale for our solution. Uh, but the great thing about Gulp is that it allowed us to uh, have small plug-in modules that anyone can work on and iterate on without having to uh, take down the entire app in, their, in the build process. Another area where we spend considerable time is how can we continue to leverage our existing infrastructure? Uh, we're, Netflix is primarily a Java shop, so we don't want to just rebuild everything in JavaScript and say we're, we're happy with that. Uh, we want to make sure we continue to use all the people that are very well versed in Java, but also see how we can interface with that in a, in a JavaScript environment. And what we did for that was make sure that we um, push our REST endpoints back to our API as much as possible and interface with that as much as we could. Uh, we also didn't want to have to rewrite our deployment infrastructure. Uh, as people probably know, we're heavily invested in EC2, uh, and we don't want to have to rewrite that in JavaScript. So there's, there's many things that we have to make sure that we uh, continue to support in our JavaScript environment, but also continue to leverage from our backend dependencies. So talk a little about our uh, final kind of learnings that we, that we had along the way. We really wanted to make sure we embrace the JavaScript ecosystem. We love JavaScript at Netflix. Uh, we have our entire TV UI layer is built on JavaScript. Uh, it's not quite JavaScript, as we can't do uh, JavaScript compilation, just-in-time compilation uh, on TVs, but uh, 
we build everything else in JavaScript. Uh, we also feel like nothing is ever done when we're working in Node. Uh, we can easily iterate and continue to uh, make our modules better uh, without impacting other users, especially other, other uh, engineers, because an hour lost is, is a lot of time when you're, when you're trying to get a feature out. So we found that every new engineer we brought into our system offered a unique viewpoint. Uh, they were able to point out areas where we had kind of missed something or hadn't really thought about it uh, as well as they had. And it, it, it's important to be able to pull in that experience and um, leverage that when you're building a new system, especially people that have been in the industry for years. Another thing we wanted to make sure we did was automate everything. Uh, when you start up your server, it goes through a whole host of things for you, uh, takes care of setting up Nginx for you, uh, local Nginx, um, building out your asset registries, your um, deploying your uh, templates and everything to a, a localized container. And all those things would be painful if you have to do them as individual tasks or something that you repeat every time you want to restart. Um, we also make use of things like live reload on the, on the browser um, to really speed up the development process. And we also want to make sure that developers test their code. And one of the areas is if you can automatically run your unit tests every time you change a line of JavaScript in a module, uh, they'll actually get written. So we don't really mean fail as in the user sees a blank page or an error page. Uh, really, we mean push out a new feature, test it, figure out what worked and what didn't, and then really iterate on both of those areas. Uh, we, we found that, uh, especially because our culture is very heavily oriented around A-B testing, uh, we found that as soon as you push something out, people are going to use it and either like it or don't like it, and they'll give you feedback right away. So, thanks, everyone. i try to give a little shortened talk, but I'd um, like to take any questions you have. Uh, so the, the question was, uh, what kind of scaling issues did we experience with Grunt? Um, so we use Gulp. Um, Grunt was uh, very linear in how it built out everything. Uh, we were using one core of a multi-core build server, um, and it allowed us, moving to Gulp allowed us to um, basically build out things that are not dependent, so like our assets aren't dependent on our templates, um, and we can run those processes separately. Things like uh, uploading our endpoints and um, you know performing a bunch of uh, you know pulling in all, all our localization files from a service, uh, all those things can happen independently of each other, uh, and Gulp was really a good fit for that. Uh, the question was around uh, internationalization. Uh, so we have, like I mentioned, 10 languages, but we want to support them in all uh, regions. So what we do is we actually have templates that are uh, localized, uh, or uh, the templates aren't localized. We have local uh, structure and stuff. So if we want to test um, you know, if this home page does better than this home page in a specific locale, we'll do an A-B test around that. Um, and then we'll kind of segment things based on uh, region. So we've broken things into uh, different parts of the world, North America, South America, Europe. Um, and that allows us to kind of centralize content around that. And then we'll also have um, localization bundles. So we just use property bundles for our strings right now. Um, but those are also localized based on a region. Um, so we can have different strings for different regions. And we also use that. Uh, we, in Dust, we have a set of helpers that allow us to just call out for just a key. And you don't have to pass in a locale or anything. We automatically figure that out. Um, same with when you're using it on the client. So when you ask for a pre-compiled pre template uh, from the server, it'll actually pre-localize it on the server and then send it down to you. Um, so you don't have to worry about that on the client. Sure. 
I think for us it was about not reinventing everything. Um, you know, we really had to pick the areas that fit well with Node. Um, so if you if you are saying, well, we're going to take our entire environment and move it to Node, it may not work out so well just because Node isn't the best for every possible combination of you know things you're trying to do. You know, we don't we don't want to have it do all of our database access because we already have something that does that really w really well, does a lot of caching, and we don't want to have to re-implement that. Um, there wasn't anything that was too painful, mostly because we were just focusing on making it our UI layer, um, having stuff already behind us, you know, all of our uh, API dependencies and deployment and everything um, really helped smooth it out. All right. Thank you, guys. Oh.